This is CSAP's Science and Policy Podcast from the University of Cambridge, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. Welcome. I'm Rob Doubleday from the Centre for Science and Policy, and you're very welcome to join us for the third episode of our podcast series, Science Policy and a Green Recovery. In the first two episodes, we've talked about the opportunities that the current crisis presents to governments to act in ways that both address the economic shock posed by COVID and also to think about investments and policies that are needed to meet net zero commitments that the UK government, for example, has entered into and other governments around the world are also discussing and entering into. Today, we're going to continue with that theme. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome Michael Pollitt, who's Professor of Business Economics from the Cambridge Judge Business School. Michael's research focuses on industrial economics, energy economics, and the regulation of utilities, particularly electricity markets. But Michael has a broad view of the economics of energy productivity. So it's a great, Michael, to be able to welcome you today. So really, we've been looking at the sort of two great political and economic crises facing governments at the moment, particularly, the, and we're thinking about the UK government, but other governments too, how to respond to the economic shock from the physical distancing that's been required because of the COVID pandemic, but also the kinds of transitions and investments that need to be made now in order to reach net zero targets and decarbonize the economy by 2050. So it's understandable that we would want to look at ways that actions that government take can support both outcomes. You know, are there ways that investment can try and hit both targets at the same time? And we've heard that there's some argument that green jobs can be more resilient, more long lasting, that green investments have, some argue, outperformed other investments in recent times. And certainly the role of the state and the the kind of economic intervention that the state is required to make now and may be required to make in order to meet net zero targets seem to create an opportunity for joined up thinking. So, So that's certainly the hope that we covered in the first two episodes. So I'm very interested to turn to to Michael. And and to begin by asking you, perhaps begin by just saying from your point of view, is the nature of the economic policy questions posed by COVID and net zero, are they ones that do allow for this kind of joined up thinking? Or are they so different that they actually require different kinds of economic policies? Well, of course, that's a great question. Um, I think... I mean, what strikes me in you asking that question is that, of course, the two things are happening on very different scales, so on very different timescales. So the COVID shock is an immediate, short, sharp shock to the economy, whereas the 2050 decarbonisation targets are about a long-term policy objective requiring deliberate investments and policies designed to pay off over the longer term. So you know, on the face of it, there's not a lot of connection between them. So if I was thinking from the point of view of the Chancellor and how you get the economy back working either during or immediately after COVID, you know, you're thinking about how do I get millions of people quickly back into work, many of whom need to go back into the jobs that they came from. So the sorts of policies that would seem to be particularly effective are things like VAT cuts for hospitality sectors or VAT cuts perhaps for actually using the transport infrastructure or things where you can create a lot of jobs very quickly, um, which we've seen in the past uh, with money going into teaching assistance or extra uh, support staff in hospitals. These are things where you can create a lot of jobs relatively cheaply. You don't need much capital. And actually, these are very different from many of the energy investments and decarbonization investments that people are talking about. And the overlap between those two two diff- very different timescales um, is actually quite small, I would have said. That's a convincing answer. The question is, do you imagine that in order to invest in create, creating or supporting jobs or stimulating the economy by cutting taxes, this is going to have a kind of a, an, an implication on government borrowing that will affect what's possible in terms of 
investing to decarbonize the economy. So there's some, you know, so there's very interesting questions I think around uh, what sort of opportunity does COVID create, and clearly the the opportunities might well be that the government has got some choices in which sectors which sectors to stimulate. That we will also have multiple calls for financial support. So a friend of mine was telling me, you know, the Dutch government have just agreed to put four billion euros into support in KLM. And of course, that's crazy. <laughs> um, you know, KLM is not a particularly successful airline. We know there's huge overcapacity in the European airline industry at the moment. And that doesn't necessarily look like a great investment anyway. And clearly, once you add the sort of climate aspect of that, you know, you would say that's not, wouldn't be a first priority of something to support. And it doesn't score that well on jobs. So clearly at the margin, there might be some things where the government could say, well, actually, this is an opportunity to try and shift where we support transport towards more low, lower carbon options. We, we know that air travel traditionally has been a, a heavily subsidized sector, which is undertaxed in terms of fuel taxes, which is often does receive a lot of state subsidy through support for airlines which are then not profitable and should have been rationalized years ago. Um, so no doubt there are opportunities to make decisions which uh, would be very tough under normal circumstances, but actually look much easier when the fiscal position is going to be very tight. And uh, you know, clearly there is an opportunity to rationalise some things. Thinking about then the kind of medium and longer term economic policies and, and thinking perhaps about the, the term green recovery, do you where do you see opportunities for government to invest in the transition to net zero? Or, or decarbonized economy that that will be commensurate with seeing a recovery of the economy over the medium and longer term. So I think one of the problems is that we haven't yet got a fully credible uh, set of policies to deliver net zero. So the question is whether the COVID crisis prompts us towards you know a more credible set of policies that will actually achieve net zero and you know at some level the 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 covid crisis makes net zero easier to achieve because the economy is going to grow more slowly for a period and so emissions will naturally be be low and we maybe do have some opportunities to shift jobs around by strategic choices of in in what industries we help to recover more quickly. But, you know, there's no getting away from the fact that the that many of the decarbonization investments that are often talked about, you know, aren't particularly job creating. So, you know, if you think about massive increase in offshore wind in the UK, I mean, offshore wind is about is one of the sectors which creates the least jobs per million uh, pounds of expenditure, you know, for very, very obvious reasons that this is, you know, incredibly capital intensive. Uh, you want to minimize the number of people who are working offshore because it's incredibly dangerous working environment. So, you know, this is not a big job creation exercise. And many of the, you know, repurposing the gas network for hydrogen, that's not a job creation exercise. That's an incredibly expensive investment, very high, you know, high tech, high capital to labor ratios in terms of the nature of the investment. So, you know, I think talking about these things, you know, as if they are job creating investments is actually uh, to miss the point of them. You know, they are primarily environmental investments. Uh, they, they're not primarily job creating. Um, and of course, the other thing to say about them from the UK point of view is many of these big decarbonisation investments would involve us importing a lot of uh, capital equipment from abroad. And that is maybe perfectly economically sensible. But of course, what are people in the UK going to actually be doing? Well, they're going to be all working in services and you know doing the sorts of tertiary jobs that we specialize in 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 the UK. So, you know, people have got a very confused view of the nature of the UK economy. They've got a confused view about how economics works. 
and also the the nature of um of of the decarbonization investments that we need to make that makes a lot of sense but how how do you respond to people that say well you know what you describe is is where the uk economy is at the moment but there's there's huge potential for new technologies for kind of new kinds of manufacturing industries to spring up and that if the uk is can is is in the vanguard of countries committing to decarbonize the economy it can spawn a whole new set of industries that can lead exports and can can change the structure of the uk economy okay well i think the place i'd start with that is let's imagine the world economy okay so forget about the uk okay imagine the world economy is decarbonizing what would be the nature of the effect of decarbonization on the world economy you know because it's a closed system and the answer is well we'd be shifting uh, our investments and the nature of our consumption away from fossil fuel based consumption and investment and the nature of employment would shift away from those uh, sort of activities so we, you know we might see less manufacturing we might see more tertiary services at the world level and we'd see a world consumption being oriented towards things that don't have a resource impact you know okay if that's what's happening at the world level what do we imagine is happening at the UK level well where the UK is going to be an exaggerated version of that so yes it's true there'll be some shifting of manufacturing towards low carbon but in aggregate we might expect to see less manufacturing um, so you know I, I was talking about you know moving from uh what we might call the cowboy economy to the spaceman economy you know what the world needs to do is to move from an economy where we were, we're trying to grow as fast as possible growth can is is being supported by us consuming our natural resources in order to increase the throughput through the world economy but actually in the future we need to move more towards uh, a closed system where we recognize we've got a finite number of resources to play with. We can't deplete our natural resources. So we need to reduce physical throughput and, you know, spend more time uh, enjoying, going to uh, enjoying personal services, entertainment, um, and, and all the sort of tertiary consumption, which doesn't involve consumption of natural resources. So if that's what's happening at the world level, I think the UK is going to be sort of at the vanguard of that. And yeah, there'll be niche industries here and there supporting the green system. But in aggregate, these industries might be quite small. And there's no reason why they'll be disproportionately in the UK, um, you know, because clearly anything needs to be man actually manufactured. You're probably going to manufacture it in Asia. Um, you know, if there's high, higher tech manufacturing, you might be doing that in Germany. And the UK, you know, is not well positioned to benefit from those sort of high tech manufacturing jobs in aggregate. You know, we're a big economy. No doubt there'll be some successful companies, but I'm not sure they'll be significant in the overall structure of the UK economy. And it's wishful thinking to think that, you know, suddenly our position in this industry is going to improve relative to other countries that are already better positioned than us. You know, you've talked about what you think could be sensible options for the UK Chancellor to consider in response to the COVID shock. What then do you think would be sensible options for the UK Chancellor to consider in terms of investment towards a, a net zero or, or space spaceman economy, as you call it? I, I think we're really rather good at thinking about how to make better use of of the resources that we have. You know, people always complain about it in the UK, don't they? You know, that we've got crowded public services, that we, you know, cut the costs of delivering things and we try to maximize the throughput while minimizing the input. You know, we're we're quite good at using our resources sort of efficiently in that sense. And I think we need to do more thinking about how we can do more with less. And no doubt. Uh, you know, lots of people in the UK will be employed uh, as consultants <laughs> advising the rest of the world how to make better use of their resources and how to move on to a sort of more service tertiary type economy. And my recommendation is we 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 do need to keep concentrating on promoting energy efficiency, on optimizing the use of data 
in in the energy system thinking about how we can squeeze more out of less and we need to you know think about only moving on large investments when we're sure we, we're going to get a, a decent return on those so thinking carefully about the timing of when we start to decarbonize our gas network for instance, thinking about the timing of when we really start promoting um, electrification of vehicles, you know, we, we want to be really quite careful about those things and not sink too much money in them too early um, before we're clear what the best option is. For the UK, again, how how reasonable is it, do you think, for the UK to assume that over the next few decades that a lot of the decarbonisation can come from electrification, you know, of heating, of cooling, of, of transportation? Or are there limits to what do you think will be possible? Um, well, I'm doing project on this at the moment. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no doubt that um, any net zero scenario involves uh, more use of electricity. So, you know, the issue is not that decarbonisation doesn't involve more use of electricity. I think the issue is is in the extent of the use of electricity. So certainly people have doubts about the ability of electricity to deliver for heavy duty transport. So, yes, we can electrify light trucks and, and you know, light vehicles and passenger vehicles. But... You know, it, it's still not at all clear that one can do it economically for for heavy duty trucking or shipping. Uh, and of course, many industrial processes. Again, you need. It's not clear that el- electrification is going to be the cheapest option. So that immediately raises the issue of continuing use of some sort of mobile fuel and. Certainly, people are looking much more seriously now at hydrogen and whether we can either have a hydrogen network, you know, a separate network for hydrogen, which uh, in a sense meets transport demand and heavy duty industrial demand. Um, And of course, once you have you have to build a network for that, then that gives rise to using it for other purposes as well. You know, so, you know, maybe you will get some lighter duty vehicles that will use hydrogen um, and you'll get some you know, domestic and commercial use of hydrogen for heating. So I think I, I think the the difficulty of full electrification gives an opportunity to the continuing use of some zero carbon gas, whether it's hydrogen or biomethane. So methane produced, if you like, from renewable sources. Yeah, I mean that I think looks highly likely that there will be some use of that. And the question is in the extent of the use. And that partly depends on, uh, you know, how successful hydrogen technologies are. And it's also, uh, you know, partly to do with things like electrolyzer costs. If you were going to use excess uh, electricity from renewables to create hydrogen from electrolysis, you know, how much would that actually cost? So there's some cost uncertainties there, which mean that the range of estimates for continuing use of gas in the energy system uh, is very wide. Because there are some good arguments being put forward that the state should, you know, take more control over the energy sector, you know, perhaps renationalize the gas and electricity sectors. How does that square with your view of, of what the overall picture is and where the UK sits in a global economy? I think there are two good reasons for thinking about renationalization. One is that there is this sort of coordination question. You know, if we've got disparate private ownership of electricity and gas, for instance, you know, maybe there's an argument for a sort of rationalization where electricity and gas networks are combined, perhaps combined in particular regions in order to jointly optimize the decarbonization of the electricity and the heating system. And then the other good argument is, well, we're going to be putting a lot of extra capital into the energy system in order to decarbonize it. We don't want to pay private sector rates of return on that. We might want to play rates of return which are much closer to government bond rates, which are very much lower. And those are two good arguments to consider. On, on the first one, it's a, it's a moot point as to whether governments are good at coordinating. I mean, certainly the history of large government monopolies in energy in the UK is not one of successful coordination. So <laughs> you might coordinate on the wrong thing. Um, and the, the the second point is much more interesting, the rate of return point. And the question is whether 
tighter regulation can deliver lower rates of return on private investments, or which I think is much more interesting, you know, the idea that you might separate private operation from private ownership of the assets, uh, you know, and certainly it would be possible to put put the energy assets into some sort of government backed vehicle, um, which was capable of accessing the bond market at very low rates of interest, while having the actual operation of the assets um, being done by private companies. So, you know, one could think of National Grid owning the, the, the transmission uh, assets in electricity and, uh, and gas, as being, you know, separated out into a, an asset vehicle, which was sort of government backed and a continuing private company that was actually employing the employees that run the assets. You know, so there may be creative things that we can do that sort of address uh, the real co- concerns that people have about, you know, private sector profits around the energy transition. And part of the implication of what you're saying is that this will require major capital investment to see this transition happen. And you're implying that there will be, we should expect lower rates of return on investment in that kind of capital. Does does that have wider implications for the economy? You know, the fact is um, that the evidence seems to be that um, rates of return on capital have been falling since records began. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's partly because capital markets are becoming have been becoming deeper and more efficient over time. You know, you can think of Originally, people were lending money to kings and queens who didn't always pay them, pay the money back, and would you know expropriate uh, the returns to it. Whereas now, of course, we've got a much better organised system of property rights, which makes it more, much more difficult for people to do that. So people are sure of getting their money back. But also, of course, the, there is diminishing marginal returns to investments over time. And again, you you just expect that as the economy grows and matures. We're expecting the economy to grow more slowly, and hence the underlying rates of return in the economy also fall um, on investments. And I think that trend is exacerbated by net zero investments because, as we said, you know, net zero investments aren't necessarily going to pay a financial return. They're going to clean up the environment, but they're not necessarily going to generate extra value added, which is monetized in the economy. So you know, I would expect returns to keep falling. Massive investment in achieving net zero is likely to to, to exacerbate falling, you know, the pressure for falling returns. I mean, what that means for our pensions, yeah, you're going to need to save more money (laughs) to earn the same pension. Going back to the point you made about, you know, maybe this is an area where there is a link. I mean, you've, you've argued very kind of convincingly that too much hope that there can be one set of policies to both address the economic shock caused by the COVID pandemic and and the need to to invest in the economy to meet net zero, that the overlap isn't as great as we might hope. And you made that argument well, but you did point at the beginning to um, strategic choices about what jobs government might want to prioritise as being one of those cases where there could be an overlap. In in practice, how, how do you you know how would you expect that kind of decision making to happen? What what kinds of considerations would you hope were being made? Well, I would hope that you know when you're when the government is essentially pumping large amounts of money into particular firms, that it does make that money conditional on certain behaviour changes and potentially uh, makes it conditional on companies no longer opposing certain things. So, you know, I, I think a good example would be airlines posing rises in fuel duty. You know, air, air fuel is one of the most undertaxed energy commodities. And the fact is, you know, you, you you pay no duty on air fuel. Whereas, of course, we know that if we fill up our tanks with gasoline, there's very high duties on that. So that's clearly a massive distortion in energy taxation, which effectively subsidizes air travel. And of course, airlines have massively opposed, you know, the imposition of fuel duty on them. And I would certainly make the imposition of fuel duty a condition of 
any continuing to support to the airline industry. So it'd be sort of things like that where you you, you can think of uh, you you know you must stop opposing this and just accept that we are going to now have proper taxation, you know, environmental taxation of of air travel. And that kind of raises questions about international coordination. To, to what extent do you think that that sort of positive move will depend? end on some level of international coordination or do you think it's reasonable to expect individual countries to be able to make progress by themselves well if, i mean you know it's like the carbon problem itself is uh, you, you, yeah international coordination is really important um but certainly we can get coordination across europe um because every european country has surely got an interest in this um and one would you know like to think that uh, other jurisdictions have similar interests as well. I mean, why why would why would the US be propping up US airlines and not taxing aviation fuel uh, properly? But of course, there are other things you can do, which such as uh, border tax adjustment and 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 simply, you know, if if people aren't going to cooperate uh, while they're flying their airlines into your jurisdiction, you, there are things that you can do to to bring them into line and not give them a competitive advantage. Maybe okay. What well, just a final final question? I, you kind of at some point the, you were saying that you really thought that people needed a more realistic understanding of how e- economies work if they're really thinking through what needs to be done between now and twenty fifty or twenty forty, wherever you want to put it. So what 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 is the sort of the what would you most like the wider kind of public or the kind of policy world to appreciate uh, that they, you feel they currently don't? What 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 one or two things about sort of that you think would help people understand the kind of the economic realities of the decisions that are need to be made um well that uh the, i think the, well i think for me one of the most important things would be um the economy is not just about net zero i mean people talk about it as if it is but that's 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 nonsense okay um you know, and and you know, the fact is, COVID, if you like, proves that no, no, <laughs> there really are things that are more important in the short run than you know, even if this long run thing continues to exist. Um, uh, you know, and you know, so we do need to worry about the here and now, and we do need to worry about uh, you know, where people are going to get the jobs of today from. Mm. Um, and and the second thing I would want people to know is. The keeping the cost of decarbonisation down is absolutely essential. You know, we, we, we've we had this sort of false period where decarbonisation hasn't been that costly because it hasn't been that extensive. And we've been able to do all sorts of policies, many of which have been very expensive. Now we actually need to get serious about doing the full thing. And that means you need to stop um, pretending that the money doesn't matter, you know. And you know, for me, the number one thing that we need to do is price carbon across the whole economy, and you know, put in place an emissions trading scheme which absolutely locks in the economy to um, the, the net zero target, and gives that economy wide incentive. Um, to reduce carbon in the least cost way, and we can have all sorts of other policies around it, which you know might be aimed at, you know, getting people to think about consumer myopia. We might have other things where we, you know, going to make a big decision on switching the gas network over to hydrogen, you know, no doubt. But what we need is this backstop policy which guarantees the decarbonisation, and and then people should stop talking about decarbonization as being something we don't know how to do i mean i know exactly how to do it it's put this uh carbon mar- comprehensive carbon market in place do that and everything else should fall in behind it if we're actually serious about achieving net zero which of course that's a moot point um but if we're serious about it i know exactly what we should do um from an economic point of view Great. Well, that's a really helpful point to end on. Yeah, I've got so many questions, but I think we'll 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 have to leave it there. But it's very yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for for joining us. It's fascinating. 
CSAP's Science and Policy podcast is a production of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This series is produced in partnership with Cambridge Zero. This episode was hosted by me, Rob Doubleday, and was produced by Kate McNeil. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or at our website, www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have any feedback about this episode, or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.